millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Or the biggest thing that I think keeps people from cooking is this sort of overarching fear of failure, that um, that cooking is difficult, that that you, when you make a mistake, you can't fix it, that you know people are going to hate it and talk about it forever, <laughs> hating it. So just kind of a negative narrative that people have around food. I think most of us just don't take it that seriously. Like if someone serves us a meal and it's not the best ever, but like it was made with love and with care, like that's, that's really special. And that's important. That's a starting place. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Come to Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money, wellness, entrepreneurship, Traveling like a boss and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future, too and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com slash wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. What was the first thing you remember learning how to cook? I think for me, it was something simple like scrambled eggs. But ever since then, I have been fascinated by food and I really love to cook. I think cooking has this reputation of being scary and expensive. And my friend, it is really anything but that. As Ken Rubin, who is an accomplished chef on his own from Ruby, our podcast guest says, start with one dish, one little thing, master that, and then build out your toolkit of food. It can literally be that simple. And yes, of course, you need to splurge from time to time, just like you do with your money. But whether you want to turn your love of food into a business or you just want to learn how to make a few killer dishes, learning how to cook is probably one of the smartest money moves you can make. And you can certainly bank on that. As I said before we hit record, uh, we're talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is food. <laughs> and um, I, I just love everything about cooking and, and kind of the, I guess I would say like the digital revolution that has gone on with food. And I, I found this interesting statistic that, you know, millennials, I guess it's really not a shock, but the millennials are prioritizing meals over savings, which, you know, kind of boggles my mind, but I guess I get it because it's the immediate indulgence. Uh, But I'd love to hear from you, like, how can learning how to cook at home really save you money? Well, it's a great, it's a great topic. And I think that um, from my vantage point, there are so many benefits to learning how to cook. It's been my, my life's mission in some ways is to get people turned on to cooking and to understand 
the role of cooking. And, you know, especially if you think about the economics of it, there are just countless reasons and countless ways that um, cooking at home, sharing food with friends and family and coworkers um, saves money and also I think makes a, a better world to, to be in. Yeah, absolutely. I always talk about my, my main mission and goal is that money, talking about money becomes a dinner time conversation because there's something about coming together around food where somehow we're able to talk about the most intimate things. Money is still one where we don't quite go there yet. <laughs> But my hopes is that I inspire people to have dinner parties where, you know, they can not only experiment with food, but also, you know, talking about tough subjects. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think food is a conduit to all of those kinds of conversations. I think um, subjects around money or saving money, especially if you're uh, a young person or a young person with a family, uh, they're very relevant. They're everyday subjects that we have to face. and. You know, we want to do it in a way that's creative and positive and that's meaningful and not, you know, for, for me at least, not to have it feel like it's a grind all, all, all the time. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I love also that cooking at home. And I think for people who maybe are a little nervous about it, I always try to share that for us, me and my husband cooking at home, we can cook a luxury meal versus, say, going out to some expensive restaurant. And even if we just look at the savings from drinks that we might have, it's pretty <laughs> significant. But we could cook something fairly luxurious at home and it still be completely economical. But I I'd love to know, like, what would you say to somebody who is just the idea of cooking at home just totally intimidates them. Or they say, you know, the, the, the lines of like, I just can't cook. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think number one, people, um, even in this day and age, when people love food, food is a big part of our media. It's a big experience for people going out to eat. So people love food, but I think people still have a fear of cooking. And a lot of that is based in, um, a lack of confidence, a fear of failure. Or mm. the way food has even become very public, like you didn't just yeah. cook it, but now you have to take a picture of it and share it. And if it doesn't look awesome, <laughs> like, I mean, it puts you a step down. So I think for, for what we do at Ruby and a lot of the work that uh, we focus on is uh, essentially establishing a, a new norm for people. And that's around a culture of cooking. It's about, um, for us really creating, uh, 21st century tools and ways of learning cooking where we're able to level the playing fields for people. My, my background is as a professional chef, uh, as a food anthropologist, very much involved with food culture, but also uh, have done most of my work within the space of culinary training and uh, training professional chefs. Uh, many people on our team had that background with professional chef uh, education. And Really, for us, it's about applying a lot of those same principles, things that are very universal to all cooks all around the world, basic techniques that you learn to apply to whatever foods you love. So we're not a recipe site. We don't focus on recipes, even though that's a lot of what happens in a kitchen, obviously. But we focus on techniques so that when you and your husband are deciding on what you want to cook for dinner and you want to do something really extravagant, you want to poach scallops and make risotto or do some other thing that um, you might be able to find a bunch of recipes that you like, and you're not sure which one you want to do, but you know you have to sear or poach, or you know right, you have to yeah. steam or sweat. And if you don't get that part right, it doesn't actually matter how good the recipe is. That's the That's the most important part of that process. So we focus on that first and foremost, so that um, no matter what you're cooking or what source of information. It could be your mom's favorite cookbook that you <laughs> grew up with or the coolest new blog or the hot celebrity chef, no matter what you're using, that you're successful. Because ultimately for us, we just want you to be confident to cook what you want to cook, not what we want you to cook, but have the basis of techniques. So you feel more free, more intuitive. So you feel more like a chef, even though you're not a chef and we don't want you to be, we want you just to feel comfortable, right? But you'll have that sense where, you can riff a little bit and make some modifications and 
you know, you like things that are really garlicky, so you're going to add more garlic and that's fine. <laughs> We're going to show you how to, how to do that. I, I like that, that you, that you say technique because when I first, my mom has always cooked, but when I first like really got into, I would say like more complicated cooking was when the Food Network first launched and I could visually watch people cook something and be like, well, I can do that. Of course I can make that. So then when I would go to the recipe, it would be like, well, that's easy. I've already seen how they've done that or how I can add an extra spin on that. And I think like that's one of the coolest things about, you know, the food revolution, I think, is just that you can have that experience. And you're right, if you have the technique, then it's not so hard to riff off whatever the dish is. Yeah. And then you can decide what flavors you want to use to build. So it's partial, you know, it's partially dependent on what you have around or what's seasonal. Like I, I'll go out to my garden right now and say, oh, wow, I've got some amazing chilies. I've got tomatoes. I've got herbs. I've got lots of squash, but yeah, my eggplants are not there yet. So that's going to be a few weeks, but I can figure out what I want based on what I have or what I know how to cook or what's comfortable versus always feeling confined by Oh, I have a recipe. I feel like I have to follow this to the T or else I'm not going to be successful. So it, it actually opens up two doors. It number one keeps you from being a slave to the recipe. So you can actually <laughs> cook food you like. It also allows you to, to do things like cook with what you have. So you're not wasting food. You're cooking in a more um, conscientious, you know, sort of fashion. You're planning a little bit more. So it just becomes a little bit more embedded in your everyday. That to me has you know, from the financial side, incredible, um, sort of impact over time. Um, and just kind of changes the way you're creative changes the way you, you, uh, are in a food space. So what would you say are some of the, maybe like the easiest things to learn how to cook if you're, if you're just starting and maybe you want something cost effective, but that is like a real showstopper. Are there certain things you should have in your toolkit yeah, great. It's a great question. So for me, cooking has always been about uh, proper planning and having a really well-stocked pantry. So dry goods, things that are shelf-stable by and large um, that you can accumulate that might be specialty, like specialty vinegars or specialty uh, dried spices or, you know, interesting honey or some other thing. And then really quality fresh product. I eat a ton of vegetables. So I like having just lots of different vegetables at all times in my refrigerator out of my garden. I would say in terms of like the showstoppers, uh, giving someone a dish that's just ultimately delicious is going to be the best way to convert them <laughs> to the idea that something <laughs> doesn't have to be expensive to be really good. So like in my world, I cook a lot of whole grains and a lot of beans and lentils paired with a lot of different vegetables. And I might make five or six different dishes um, that are all fairly simple, but are all very different um, in, a, uh, in a given evening, right? So it could be like very simple roasted carrots. And those carrots could be like super premium, nice organic carrots, but they're still only like $3 a pound. So like a little bit of carrots, <laughs> a little bit of green beans, a little bit of broccoli or cauliflower, and then some beans and grains that are prepared really, really simply that I can maybe make them into something different a little bit the next day, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Makes it a meal where I now have a, for me, a perception of a, a vast variety of choice. I'm not like, oh, I'm eating a bowl of beans and a salad. I'm like, wow, I have four different salads, <laughs> three different starches, right? So you can mix it up. Those things on a cost per dish basis turn out to be incredibly low. All those legumes and starches and whole grains, it might seem like when you're at the Whole Foods bulk bin, wow, it's $4 a pound for those lentils. But those lentils will make like 12 or 14 servings <laughs> out of that pound of beans. So your cost per serving is still incredibly low, um, which is just you know from the point of like, hey, how much density of nutrition do you get for your dollar? Just one of the best ways you can you can do really well. Yeah, I've watched a ton of documentaries. I'm just fascinated by stories of urban gardens and how a lot of entrepreneurs have gone in uh, lower income neighborhoods and really 
taught people how for very little expense, you can grow a lot of your own food and things like you're talking about, uh, beans and, and, you know, all sorts of different things where you can create these amazing healthy meals for not a lot of money and be eating way better than fast food. And then how that translates in your body to how you feel, how you think, how you handle situations, like all of the, how you sleep. I mean, there's just so many, uh, so many things happen from what you eat that I yeah. feel like even if you just learn how to cook a few things, like you're really doing a great amount of justice to your overall life. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, two things that you said just resonated. Number one, um, the fact that you're now eating maybe a little bit differently, a little bit lower on the food chain, uh, closer to the earth is definitely going to have an impact on your health. And regardless of your orientation, right? If you're like more vegetable leaning or you want to eat more paleo or whatever it is, like eating those sorts of things are just going to be generally very good for you. Um, low impact, low cost, high protein, high carb, like it's going to be good for your body. Um, so there's a lot to be said just for the health, the health component. Um, you know, the other thing is just the, the cost of your health over time is also significant. So by eating better, <laughs> you're really yeah. investing in your long-term health so that when 10 or 20 years rolls by, you're not a candidate for that surgery or that procedure or that medicine. And you've had a perfectly awesome life, um, saving money along the way, but you also don't have like hospital bills and chronic illness and all these things that are frankly killing our healthcare system. These are all in many ways, very preventable diseases of affluence related to lifestyle and food is at the core of that. So while it makes great individual sense, the, the cumulative effect at a population in a community has really incredible, um, you know, impact, positive impact, the potential for changing our entire, uh, sort of long term ability as a society to thrive in a certain way. Yeah, so, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. I used to be an athlete and when I, a few years ago, I went to a nutritionist because I thought, you know, I, my body could probably be operating a little bit better. I was getting tired and sluggish a lot. And so we changed up what I ate and the nutritionist was like, I want you to limit your exercise. Like I want you to do very, very little exercise. And I was like, what? Isn't that, doesn't that help me? lose weight or, you know, feel better about my body. He's like, yes, but I want to show you how the power of what you put in your mouth can literally change everything for you. And it was just amazing in, in not even that long, just even a week or two, what I started to feel in my body, I thought, my God, like this is the power of food. And so many of us don't experience that because we just keep eating the same things over and over again. But there is just so much power, even if you just switch up a little something in how you're eating and maybe you're always eating lunches out or dinners out or something like that. But really changing that up, I mean, not only from a money standpoint, but from a health standpoint, it's crazy what it does to your body. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I think, you know, the uh, the approach of normalizing, even just beginning to take a step into it is absolutely the best option for most people. So finding two or three or four things they like to cook that um, are delicious and you crave them and you can share them with your fr with your family and not feel like embarrassed or whatever um, that also are really inexpensive just on a, a per serving basis and this is how we eat mostly in my house we batch cook beans and grains and I roast vegetables when they're fresh and we'll freeze things and we'll do various things I'll pickle things so that we have a lot of varied, you know, like a lot of varied foods. We don't get sick of things. Um, we're making use of what we have as best we can. You know, we spend the money where we want to spend it on, on our food dollars. Otherwise we're not just, you know, kind of throwing it around. We, as a family, we're food obsessed. So we, we spend a lot <laughs> more money than most families because, uh, you know, we'll seek out certain products and, it, you know, food has been my life for since I can remember. So it's still probably disproportionate for us. Uh, in terms of time and, and, and money. But, uh, for me, it's more about the relationship that we're fostering with food and the value of food. Um, that there's intrinsic value to 
uh, being a part of the process, growing it, um, processing, harvesting, um, cooking it, eating it, and sharing it are all part of that process. And uh, I think it, it forms the basis for the kind of respect and discipline um, that's just good, good for families. And it, you know, I think you said it, you know, really well earlier in the conversation creates a context for those conversations around that dinner table that are those important life conversations. Um, that's kind of where life happens for, for most people. So yeah. it's important to realize that that's a sacred space that needs to be maintained, uh, on a family by family basis. So have you always been interested in food? Has this been sort of a lifelong obsession for you? Yeah, I was, I was food obsessed at a very early age, started cooking, um, and collecting cookbooks very young. I actually thought about it, uh, very much from a business perspective as a young person. I wow. catered my own bar mitzvah. <laughs> so <laughs> That's it gave, fantastic. yeah, it gave me an opportunity to present my parents with a business plan and a budget. <laughs> and I had some, some comparables I could work on based on the fact that I have two older brothers who had it, had it outsourced. So, so we wound up doing it at my parents, what was in my parents' house. We cleared out the house. We rented tables and I did most of the cooking with my mom and we spent six weeks beforehand and we cooked for 150 people. Wow. And, uh, yeah, my mom wrote me a check afterwards because of the difference in the cost. And that's the check that bought my first car that I got when I graduated college. So yes. I had the foresight to, to put it away. And that was the car. I mean, literally the car I drew, uh, that I drove until just like two years ago. So it was a great, a great investment in my time at a very young age, but I was food obsessed uh, from a very young age, knowing that I needed to have a part of it. I thought food was, um, just a great connector. Um, I've always been interested in the health aspects of it as well as the growing aspects, but really, you know, my, my passion has been sort of manifested, uh, most recently in this idea around, um, this culture of cooking, teaching people to cook for all the various reasons why it's good, whether it's, uh, related to a job or related to your, your home economics or your health. Um, for many people, it's just behavior and lifestyle. Like it's just a healthy habit to be in like any other healthy habit. Um, even if you're not cooking particularly healthy food, I think just the act of cooking it versus getting it packaged or partially packaged, um, has, you know, great, great impact for people. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news? Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all in one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30 day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash ETM. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash ETM. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash ETM for your extended 30-day free trial.
Yeah, we have this rule in our house that if we're going to eat sweets, we have to make it ahead of time. So two things either happen. One, we make it and we eat a little bit of it and we're done or we get all the ingredients for it. And then we go, you know, we don't want to eat something sweet anyway. <laughs> and so we end up changing our mind. But you you brought up, I love your story about cooking for your, for your bar mitzvah. Are there any tips that you could share about like cooking for a dinner party or a large group of people of like maybe how you can do that more economically? Yeah, I think, and you know, I think for me, it's not about sacrificing like the awesomeness of the food for the economics, but I think people are really impressed um, when you show just a variety of colors and flavors and textures, and it doesn't take like a lot of money to make that happen. So again, I was kind of explaining meals where I've put together, you know, literally eight or 10 things on a table, which are all different colors and textures. Some are hot, some are cold. And for the way people eat now, they want to taste lots of things. They're not going to love everything, but it gives everyone a set of things that they know they're going to like and something right. to talk about. And I try to surprise people um, in some ways with just like simplicity, like this dish might just be, you know, uh, yellow beets, this herb and this vinegar, and that's all it is. Right. So that's really interesting or something more complex, like on a platter with various elements, but it's for me, it's more about creativity than the cost. I can spend, you know, six dollars making lentils for 25 people and have that be part of a main dish. And, you know, for that kind of a cost, be like, wow, I can now afford to put $14, you know, a pound wild mushrooms in that dish and make ah, the dish yeah. really decadent and really amazing. And people are like, wow, look at that giant pile of chanterelles. It's like, well, yeah, it's sitting on lentils. It's not sitting on lobster, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, a little goes a long way when you're really strategic about how a, a meal reads. I very much think about um, presenting a meal like that, like a book where you want to have various elements and twists and turns and things that people can find as a surprise. Um, and that just takes more timing and planning and thoughtfulness more than like the cost of the uh, ingredient. Um, so for me, it's about him hey, having a dinner party. I might start three or four days in advance. I might do some quick pickles on some cucumbers or radishes or onions or a combination of vegetables. I might make some vinaigrettes in advance. I might pre-cook three or four or five different kinds of beans and grains, maybe as a a cold salad or a warm dish or as a topping in a salad or a component. Um, you know, I can even, depending on what I'm making, like pre-cook some vegetables, just part cooked vegetables that might get, you know, mm, finished yeah. in some other way. So all these things, you know, don't just kind of save, you know, kind of money from the batch perspective, but also save time. I mean, you know, time is really valuable resource for, for people too. But I, I try to make those times really count when I'm cooking to, simmer two things at once or roast, you know, three things in a sheet pan versus one thing in a sheet pan and kind of do triple duty during that same period of time. Such great tips. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, like, how did your love then for food uh, translate and evolve into Ruby? So I, I mean, I had a pretty, uh, like eclectic and circuitous pathway to Ruby, but I, um, <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, I grew up knowing that food would be a thing, but I was pretty convinced that I was going to be a physician or a surgeon because I would, you know, mm, cut things yeah. up like I was going to put them back together again. But I wound up in college getting really interested in social anthropology and the anthropology of food and cooking, which is specifically that notion of that relationship between food and culture, the idea that you are what you eat. Um, and this was in the nineties when this was a very much, uh, emerging field of study. And I was able to get in, you know, very early and have a lot of content, you know, expertise, having known food already for a long time and interest in cooking. But I was able to hook up with an anthropologist who just happened to be a food anthropologist, um, where I went to school, a very small college and pretty limited faculty. And I happened to have a food specialist. So. I wound up working very closely with him and doing work around food and NAFTA and looking at indigenous oh, wow. food, um, looking at indigenous food and culture change in Mexico as a result of NAFTA in the nineties and looking at kind of the 
change in dietary patterns amongst indigenous people moving to an urban center and having health issues. And I was working on some public health initiatives in Mexico for a number of years as a result of some of that work. And then wound up going to graduate school in Austin, Texas, continuing that work, but um, getting more into the questioning around, well, just from a cultural perspective, how do people learn to cook? What is the cultural phenomenon of passing on cooking knowledge or the acquisition of food cooking knowledge? So when someone talks about passing on a tradition, what do they mean by that, really? And that's kind of what I was studying, creating research methods for that that could be applied uh, cross-culturally within the food world. Um, and, uh, you know, through graduate school, I was really interested in food, obviously, from a practical perspective still. So <laughs> I was um, I was working as a cheesemaker on a raw milk dairy in Texas. Oh. I was working as a cook. At one point, I was a food critic for a magazine in Texas. So I, I did a number of things. And then I got involved with culinary education. Um, the restaurant industry was great. I enjoyed it. Um, but ultimately got involved with education and training and was able to work at a variety of professional culinary schools, had an amazing opportunity to work um, with uh, Le Cordon Blue Schools North America and opened up, helped open up many of their campuses around North America. And, uh, you know, just big growth period for the time of the food business. And um, that was kind of my background initially within culinary training, I wound up working for the Art Institutes and opening up one of their professional culinary programs, but just had a background in, um, in doing work kind of on one hand within culinary education and the other, on the other hand, within food, um, kind of food culture research. So keeping a hand in the, the social research side of anthropology and doing yeah. research around food products and food trends, working with product development, R and D companies, companies who want cultural insights, but who can also talk to a chef. So, I've had to wear a lot of different hats doing these things. Um, and I joined Ruby seven years ago, really with this amazing passion for this idea around uh, democratizing access to culinary instruction, that people don't need to spend a lot of money at a fancy culinary school to get basic foundation training that I think is a human right for people. And that um, there's just a whole different way to learn and leveraging online and leveraging other sorts of learning experiences um, for many people is a much better option than, you know, getting into a huge amount of student debt <laughs> or having to relocate their family to another city to go learn cooking uh, or something like that. So uh, many of yeah. our professional students come to us because we're a tiny, tiny fraction of the cost and we don't have the risk that might be involved with the other, the other approach. So they're, you know, those are great schools. I, I love watching those schools, you know, continue to thrive in some ways, you know, professional culinary schools. There's a amazing opportunity in this world still to go to one of those top flight schools and get the education and become a you know, world-class chef, but it's, it's too big of an industry. There's, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of jobs out there <laughs> that are unfilled in this business. And, um, it's not going to happen through conventional cooking schools. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. So with Ruby then, can, you know, anyone from somebody who's maybe just learning how to cook or is a home cook to someone who wants to become a more professional? Are there, are there courses and options for all of those different varieties? Yeah, we, we have learning, op, you know, uh, different, uh, different uh, opportunities for all kinds of people. We work a lot in the pro cook enterprise space. So, um, you know, we train, for instance, many thousands of cooks um, around the world with Marriott and hotels that Marriott owns. Uh, we've had over 15,000 cooks in five languages, actually, at Marriott companies work with us for training. But we also work um, directly with people who, uh, you know, might be interested in joining the food, the food world in some way, shape, or form. They want to be a, a cook or they want to have a food cart or be a blogger or a, whatever it might be. They want to get some cooking education, but they can't afford the forty or $80,000 to go to a conventional cooking school. So they might come to us and say, hey, I want to see if I'm interested in this, dip their toe in the water, learn with us. Some of them might go on to a conventional culinary school. Um, some 
decide it's not for them. Some decide it's their passion, that they have enough information to go on and do their own thing. They start a blog or develop a product. We, we started at Ruby an online professional certification just for professional cooks, which is, you know, kind of alternative pathway towards traditional cooking school. We also started a, uh, the first ever actually in the world, the first ever online professional certification for plant-based cooks, which has been incredibly popular. Um, our company has a kind of a deep passion around plant-based and all the ramifications for that world. And we just saw an incredible market interest in that starting a few years ago. So we're, we're definitely watching that space very closely. We have a very big presence in that space. People, um, you know, I think as a, from a health perspective, have a hard time making those things taste good. And we found a real sweet spot in working with organizations and people who, who have a passion for those things. So those people become health coaches. They start small businesses where they're doing. Uh, maybe, you know, yoga classes and health coaching and cooking, or they're merging their cooking expertise or interest with some other part of their world. Um, so it's really interesting to see how people are kind of carving out their own niche and how food can, can play a part in their professional and their, their personal growth. That's great because I mean, there's so many different avenues you can go down. We think of just traditional chef, but like you just said, there's just so many different careers you could have, whether you have a blog or you're a professional chef or you do yoga or whatever it might be. I think that's just fascinating of how you could bring in the food element from a real like educated point of view and really offer a tremendous amount of value to someone. Yeah. And to help them, you know, again, kind of have a better relationship with food. All of the people who learn with us, um, you know, wind up, I think, forming a relationship to food that is very much exploratory and self-directed. It's based in an interesting combination in our audience between really needing to learn, like people who have a health or wellness goal or a job need, you know, kind of falls into that higher, like a uh, priority sort of camp versus just a casual person who's like, oh yeah, cooking's kind of cool. Like, so we like engaging <laughs> people who really feel like they have something to gain Because when they work with us and we get them into our world and we start teaching, the amount of satisfaction that they get uh, becomes like infectious for others. They become very much, oh my gosh, I have to get all my friends to cook more and (laughs) learn cooking. And you wouldn't believe how well I cook right now. I never thought I could cook. And now I'm like enjoying this. Like, um, because not everyone, not everyone likes it that people, you know, cooking is a challenge for so many people. And, we just want to help people change that narrative, even if it's just for a few dishes, just to get them started. That's so cool. Well, last question. I'm just curious, like, what do you think is maybe the biggest myth about cooking that we can burst to inspire everyone to just go out tonight and cook a great meal? Yeah, I think the biggest myth about cooking <clears throat> or the biggest thing that I think keeps people from cooking is this sort of overarching fear of failure. That, um, that cooking is difficult, that, that you, when you make a mistake, you can't fix it, that, you know, people are going to hate it and talk about it forever, <laughs> hating it. So just kind of a negative narrative that people have around food. I think most of us just don't take it that seriously. Like if someone serves us a meal and it's not the best ever, but like it was made with love and with care, like that's, that's really special and that's important. That's a starting place. So no one should ever feel like, that their food thing has gotten them down. We, we want to help lift people up. And, you know, there's always a path forward for people, no matter where you are. Like you can't hold a knife. Like we'll show you how to hold a knife. You don't know how hot your pan should be before you add your vegetables. Like we're going to show that to you. <laughs> That's like really how we teach. <laughs> like we're going to start with such the basics so that you could not just know how to do it. You could probably teach your friend, right? Like, you can teach your spouse. Like that's the way we want to teach you is that you, you could turn around and explain it to someone in a few minutes uh, because the principles are not, are not crazy. Like cooking used to be the thing that most everyone could do or do in like a nominal way. We could, you know, put water in a pan and cook something, right? Um, <laughs> now it's become so alien and it, because of that becomes this like uh, this reproduction of fear. So I think the biggest thing is cooking's not scary. It just takes practice. 
it just takes kind of doing it and kind of realizing what you like and what you don't like. And um, people's tastes change over time. You might love something one day and think it's just okay the next, and that's fine. Uh, just keep going. You're going to be hungry in a few hours anyway. That is awesome. Well, Ken, this has been so fantastic. I feel like I could talk about food forever, but tell everyone where they can go to learn more about Ruby. So you can uh, quite simply go to ruby.com and that's spelled R-O-U-X-B-E.com. Um, we have lots of different options. If you contact us, we're also happy to walk you through kind of different offerings and different things that we can work with you on. So happy to have you join us. Thanks so much for checking out this episode and a big thanks to our sponsors that make this show possible. Remember to subscribe in your favorite podcast player so you never miss an episode. But before you leave, I want to empower you to embrace where you are today, the good and the not so good. And remember, nothing lasts forever. Just keep taking small steps every day and remember how awesome you truly are. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com, where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC.